Good evening all and welcome. Thank you for joining us. My name is Melissa Hendricks and I am the Associate Director of the Johns Hopkins Science Writing Program. And tonight is um, one of our ongoing series of author talks, talks with writers who are writing about timely and exciting issues in science, medicine, and technology. Uh, but tonight is a very special event because we are featuring our um, very own Sam Apple, who is a key faculty leader of this science writing program. Um, and we're actually uh, very honored to have two guests for this author talk. And I will just briefly introduce um, the two. First, as I mentioned, our featured author, Sam Apple. Many of you in the audience, I'm sure, know Sam as a teacher, an academic advisor, or the host of our popular Science Writing Community Facebook page. But Sam is also a book author. And I was just looking through his list of published books, trying to find maybe is there a common theme connecting all of them? And I have to say that I failed in that regard. I could not find a common theme. Uh, but um, all I can say is that Sam is the author of an eclectic collection of books, which include Schlepping Through the Alps, My Search for Austria's Jewish Past with Its Last Wandering Shepherd, American Parent, My Strange and Surprising Adventures in Modern Babyland. And after this evening, you may be interested in reading um, uh, several of those. For Sam's most recent book, he turns to a very different subject, the metabolism underlying cancer. His book, Ravenous, Otto Warburg, The Nazis and the Search for the Cancer Diet Connection will be released May 25th. And just a little plug, it's available for orders now. And uh, so this event is um, in a way, Sam's official book launch. It is also my great pleasure to introduce our second guest, Chi Van Dang. Chi is a world-renowned cancer biologist. He elucidated how a mutation commonly found in cancer disrupts cell metabolism, and that discovery has spawned a whole panoply of research examining how targeting tumor metabolism could lead to novel cancer therapies. Chi is a member of the National Academy of Medicine, a fellow of the American Association for Cancer Research, and has been selected to the list of highly cited researchers. And Chi also has many connections to our university. He earned his medical degree from the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and was an Osler Medical Resident at Johns Hopkins Hospital and later returned to Johns Hopkins as uh, a professor of medicine. And now he is at a different institution, a professor at the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia, and is also scientific director of the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research, an international community of distinguished cancer researchers. So for this author talk, uh, rather than a conventional reading, we thought it would be interesting to do things a little differently. So tonight, Sam will uh, discuss his book and then have a conversation with Chi. So without further delay, I will now pass the virtual microphone on to Sam. Okay, thank you very much, Melissa. And uh, thank you to the Hopkins Science Writing Program and to the uh, Kimmel, Sydney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center for uh, co-hosting tonight's event. I'm really uh, honored to be launching my book uh, at, uh, via Hopkins event. Uh, the book actually comes out on Tuesday, but um, I'm considering this the launch. And uh, I'm especially honored to have Chi Van Dang here with me. Uh, I don't think that um, I would have written this book if not for Chi's uh, brilliant research on, on cancer metabolism. So uh, it really means a lot to me that Chi uh, is here to, to mark this moment with me. 
And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit and read a little bit, and then uh, I'll have a chance to chat with Chi. Uh, so just to uh, start off, I'm going to uh, share my screen and, and go through a few slides to, to tell you a little bit about the book. So, uh, so you see um, the cover of my book, Ravenous. And um, I thought I, I would begin by just telling you how I came up with the idea or decided to write about this. Uh, it was around 2013 or so. I was interested in, in um, metabolism in, in general, and I found myself reading about the relationship between uh, obesity and, and diabetes and cancer. Um, that's the sort of thing I do in my free time. Um, and uh, I was really, you know, fascinated by the connection to cancer in particular, because, you know, it sort of made sense to me in an intuitive way that diabetes and obesity were, were fundamentally linked, but I hadn't thought of cancer as a part of that story. And, you know, there are these very powerful correlations which show that, that many types of cancer, 13 at, at current count, seem to, to correlate quite closely with uh, obesity. So it seemed mysterious to me. And, uh, you know, I was reading about the history and what was also fascinating to me is that in the 19th century, you see obesity and, and diabetes and cancer all sort of emerging at the same time and then sort of growing in lockstep uh, throughout the uh, late 19th and 20th century. So it was all very interesting to me. And, and as I was reading about this, I, um, I came across a mention of a, a German scientist named Otto Warburg who had made a, an interesting discovery about cancer. And um, that discovery, which was made in 1923, it was really the, the cancer cells eat in a fundamentally different way from, from other non-growing cells where there's a typical cell will take up glucose from our blood and metabolize it uh, in the mitochondria, which you may have heard of or are sometimes referred to as the, um, the power plants of the cell. And they basically burn the nutrients with oxygen, which is a very efficient way to create energy. But cancer cells were actually doing something very different, something you know very surprising to Warburg. Instead of burning our food with oxygen. They were burning it without oxygen uh, through this alternative process. You, you, know, you might think of it as a backup generator of sorts, which is fermentation. Uh, it's the same process that microorganisms use when they're used in the production of beer and, and, and wine and uh, bread and yogurt and cheese. And it, it, it's much less efficient, but um, it involves taking up a lot of glucose, just basically splitting it into getting a little bit of energy out of it and, and spitting out the waste outside of the cell. In the case of some microorganisms, that will be alcohol and carbon dioxide. But it, with humans, it's lactic acid. And um, it was just a very, very surprising discovery. And, and Warburg saw that this, he tested many different cancers and he would see this weird metabolism over and over again. So he became convinced that this was something really fundamental to, to what cancer is. And, um, you know, he became convinced really that it was the key to understanding cancer. Um, so just, just to give you kind of a, a little bit of a feel for what this means, I, I'd like to um, talk about uh, <clears throat> an example that uh, I'm <laughs> borrowing slash stealing from uh, Craig B. Thompson, uh, the president and CEO of Memorial Sloan Kettering. I know that uh, Craig, who I interviewed for this book, got it. Uh, from uh, somebody on the internet. So I think it's fair game, but um, it just really, it's a very simple demonstration, I, I think, or explanation of, of how fundamental metabolism is. You know, as, as Craig explained it to me, you can think of all the cells in a multicellular organism uh, as being a, almost in a, in a social contract. And they, they've made this agreement to, to only take up nutrients when they have permission to do so from, from other cells, from signals. Whereas a an individual organism, a, a microorganism, a single-celled organism doesn't have that social system. It, it simply multiplies whenever it finds food. Uh, you, know, you put yeast on a bread and it just eats and eats and eats and, and, and multiplies. And uh, you know what Craig Thompson was telling to me is that um, you can think of cancer cell is, is very similar to these microorganisms. Uh, it sort of is a breakdown of the social contract and, and they act just like the yeast cell take up, as soon as they find nutrients, they'll take them up and, and they'll multiply. And, um, you know, it's remarkable that it's the eating that seems to inspire the growth just as in a, in a microorganism. And, um, you know, the other, the other parallels are fascinating as well as, you know, Thompson pointed out that if you look near the crust, you have 
the yeast growing, but um, it has all the carbon, all, you know, it, it needs and the nitrogen, but it, it's running out of water near the crust. So without all the right nutrients, you see some of the cells will, will essentially break away from the colony and form a new colony and start to grow. And, and that's very parallel to metastasis, which is, you know, the spreading of cancer, which is actually uh, what kills us. So this is, you know, to me, just sort of an eye-opening way to think about cancer, to think about not just the cell being able to divide whenever it wants, because that's of course what a cancer needs to do, but, but also to be able to eat whatever it wants. And, and there's some reason to think that it's really the eating that comes first in, in the same way uh, that microorganisms multiply after they eat. Because if a cell is able to divide as much as it wants, but doesn't have the nutrients to support that growth, it's uh, it's gonna collapse. It's a, uh, Thompson refers to it as a catastrophe for the cell. So. The, the taking up of nutrients is, is really fundamental, I think, to what cancer is. And um, so this, you know, when I started learning about all this, I was pretty fascinated, but I still hadn't decided to write about it. And um, I'm not sure that I would have ever written about it unless I had uh, Googled uh, Otto Warburg, just because you know, I knew nothing about him. I knew the name Warburg was connected to a famous Jewish financial family in, in Germany who, uh, you know, were behind the Warburg banking dynasty. But I had no idea who Otto Warburg uh, was, and um, you know, after a couple minutes of reading about him, I decided that um, all right, I, I need to write about this because, you know, uh, I'm a journalist, and you know, first and foremost, a storyteller. When I'm looking for science stories, what I'm looking for is you know, first science that fascinates me, and uh, you know, the way that cancer cells take up energy seem you know really interesting to me, and then I'm trying to find if there's a character, a protagonist that I can match to that science. And, and when I have both of those, that's when I, I really decide to write about something. So, you know, once I saw that I could tell the story through Warburg's life, I, I was really fascinated. And I'm just going to very quickly sort of give you uh, an overview uh, of who Warburg was. Uh, he was born in the late 19th century and his father was a very prominent physicist, Neil Warburg. And uh, Emil Warburg was the, um, he had a chair in, in physics at Berlin University, which is very unusual for someone of a Jewish background. And he was close with Einstein and Max Planck and Fritz Haber and, and all of the sort of world famous German scientists of that era. So Warburg grows up with these men and he's, you know, just obsessed with science, determined to be a great scientist himself. He said he pitied everybody who didn't become a scientist. and. Um, He's intent on, on being not just a scientist, but a, a scientist who changes the world. And um, he, um, you know, his father is a physicist and he wants to outdo his father, but, um, you know, he decides he's going to do it in the realm of biology. So if he's going to make his statement on, on Germany and the world. He decides it's going to be in cancer science because, as I mentioned before, you know, cancer had been growing more and more common in, in Germany by the 1920s. It had really become, you know, something of a of a panic. Um, you know, no one understood why cancer was growing more common. So Warburg sets off to do this, and uh, in 1923 he makes this remarkable discovery about cancer cells and fermentation, which I've already alluded to. And um, he's really at the top of the scientific world. And um, in 1931 he wins the Nobel Prize. He should have won it in 1926 for his cancer research, but they instead uh, gave it to him in 1931 uh, for his research on how cells breathe. Um, but um, everything, you know, sort of comes to a halt, of course, in 1933, uh, which is the year that um, the Nazis come to power. And, uh, you know, at this point, most of Warburg's colleagues who are Jewish decide to flee Nazi Germany. And uh, Warburg could have done the same. And in a way, he had more reason to do it than almost anyone, because in addition to being of Jewish descent, Warburg was uh, not quite openly gay, but as close to openly gay as, as one could be in Nazi Germany. He lived with his, his partner and you know went everywhere with his partner and they were always together uh, and he didn't try to hide this. So, uh, you know, he was in a uniquely vulnerable position. And yet, um, you know, as the Nazis began to harass him in the, in the early 1930s, he, um, would uh, you know basically just provoke them at, at every opportunity? So now I'm going to read uh, just for a few minutes from the the first pages uh, from my book, uh, which will give you kind of a sense. I, I hope 
of the type of person Warburg was and what it was like for him in the 1930s being harassed by uh, the Nazis. In this particular passage, it's about a Nazi customs official who is intent on uh, sort of getting Warburg, uh, I think mostly just to harass Warburg, but getting him to sign a form that says he's of Aryan descent. And without that, they're not going to give him alcohol, the, the ethanol that he uses for his lab. Okay. So the door to the Institute was opened by an employee, probably one of Warburg's research assistants, who told the Nazi official that Warburg was unavailable. Tesh left the blank Aryan descent forms with an employee, making clear that he needed it returned within 48 hours. Three days later, still awaiting the filled out form, Tesh called the Institute. A secretary answered and passed the handset to Warburg. I served in the military and was an officer, Warburg blared into the phone. It is out of the question that I will sign this form. Though Tesh already knew that Otto Warburg was not of Aryan descent, there was something else about Warburg that he likely did not know when he placed that call. Whether Warburg was the greatest biochemist of the air was debatable, but he was almost certainly the most self-important biochemist who ever lived. As a colleague put it, measuring arrogance on a scale of one to 10, Warburg rated 20. Warburg was so enamored with himself that he once refused even to be photographed with a group of scientists he beamed beneath him. And the number of the scientists in the group were Nobel Prize winners. For someone entirely convinced of his own greatness, the idea of Nazi lowlifes telling him which chemicals he could and could not order was almost unthinkable. As Warburg once put it to his sister, I was here before Hitler. Still fuming days after the phone call, Warburg ordered a secretary to call the customs office that had sent Tesh to his institute. Professor Warburg does not wish to see the customs official who delivered the forms again, the secretary announced, and if necessary, would have him removed from the building. The Nazi official on the other end of the line was stunned, but Warburg's secretary wasn't finished. Asked to explain why Warburg was behaving so rudely to a government official, the secretary responded that Tesh had arrived at the Institute unshaven and spread unpleasant odors around him. The odors, he clarified, had presumably originated from an unclean body. To the hygiene-obsessed Nazis, few insults could have been more offensive. While the archival documents suggest the secretary was a she, it was likely Warburg's male partner, Jacob Heiss, who told off the customs official. Heiss, who would later become the administrator of the Institute, was rarely far from Warburg's side and was in the habit of shouting people down on his behalf. Warburg's message did not get through to the customs office. Tesh reappeared at the Institute that same day, demanding the completed Aryan descent form. An employee led him to the laboratory room with an open door. Standing before the entrance to the room, the Nazi official came face to face with several researchers, including Warburg. Warburg was a handsome and compact man. He kept his hair short, neatly parted to one side, and swept back over an always clean, shaven face. On the day that Tesh returned to the Institute, Warburg would have been wearing a white lab coat over one of the cardigans with tailored English sports coats he favored. Few things annoyed Warburg more than interruptions of his work. To avoid unwanted visitors, he installed a brass plaque by the door of the Institute, indicating that visiting hours began at 6.30 p.m. In photos, Warburg's heavily lidded blue eyes had a dreamy quality, leaving the impression of a man lost in deep thought. But if Tesh directed his gaze to Warburg at this moment, he almost certainly would have been met with eyes that could fill with spark shooting rage, as one biochemist recalled. Tesh had never met Warburg and did not recognize him. As he stood before the laboratory door, that's right, and did not recognize him as he stood before the laboratory door. As Warburg approached, Tesh raised his right arm to the ceiling and stiffened it at 45 degrees in a rigid Nazi salute. Warburg was expected to salute back. Instead, he walked past Tesh and into the hallway without speaking. Tesh was flabbergasted. It was an outrageous disregard of a civil servant who is a representative of the National Socialist State, he wrote in a report on the incident. With Warburg now standing behind him in the hallway, Tesh demanded his name. According to Tesh's testimony, Warburg turned halfway around, announced who he was, and pointed down the hall. There's the door, Warburg said. Leave the building. Warburg would have to repeat the demand several more times before Tesh finally departed. Warburg immediately filed a formal complaint with the customs office. Um, okay, I'll, I'll stop there, but um, the end of this little segment, Warburg not only tries to file a complaint to the very office that's harassing him, but he goes to Max Planck, the head of German science, and demands that the Nazis rewrite their regulations to accommodate him. So it you know, just gives you a sense of his outlook. And um, 
the, you know, this is only one of many incidences, uh, many incidents where he really provoked the Nazis. You know, one time the Brown Church came and tried to get his employees to come to a Nazi march and Warburg chased them away and said he'd burn down his institute first. So the, the amazing thing is not only that Warburg survived, really, but that he, he provoked the Nazis at, at every possibility. And things, you know, did get increasingly dicey for Warburg. And um, as the war progressed, uh, or as, you know, the Nazi regime progressed, um, it looked like he was in severe trouble. He had missed his chance to leave. And in 1941, uh, June 21st, 1941, he's called to the Nazi headquarters, Hitler's new chancellery that he built. And he meets with this Nazi functionary, Victor Brock, who is one of the architects of the Nazi euthanasia program. And it really looks dire, but at this meeting, Warburg is told that uh, he'll be allowed to continue his research and to stay in Nazi Germany despite his ancestry and, and despite you know, being obviously gay because uh, on the condition that he continue to research cancer and focus on cancer. And it's amazing, you see that um, Himmler met with Brock that day to discuss Warburg's case. And, and later that night, Hitler and Goebbels' diary, it shows that Hitler was talking about cancer research that night. So it would have been, it would have been striking that the Nazis were focused this much on Warburg and cancer really at any time, given this, they were in you know World War II, but it wasn't just any night that they brought Warburg in. Uh, only hours later, they launched Operation Barbarossa, which was the biggest military invasion in history and you know, the invasion of the Soviet Union. Um, it was really the, you know, an absolutely critical moment in the Nazi project. And that they took time, you know, just hours before to think about Warburg and, and cancer research is, is really astonishing. And I don't really have time to go into it here, but um, it only makes sense, I think, when you read uh, about Hitler's obsession with cancer. And it wasn't just Hitler, it was a number of the top Nazis, but Hitler in particular, and um, the story of, of Hitler's uh, mother dying of breast cancer when he was still a teenager and, and how devastated he was and you know how much that, that shaped um, his life and um, made him a hypochondriac in, in part who was, who was terrified of cancer. So uh, I can't go into all that now because there are a lot of, um, different things I want to talk about tonight, but um, this is my favorite picture of Warburg, which I think captures his, his personality really uh, better than any other. And I, I can imagine that he made that face all the time. Um, and so, so Warburg survives and um, after the war, he, uh, his, his discovery of fermentation in cancer cells, um, you know, was, was world famous and, and influenced cancer research for many years, but after the war, it falls out of favor. Uh, I think there's a number of different reasons. It's partially because uh, Warburg was making really extreme statements. And although he had made a fundamental discovery about cancer, his explanation for why the cancer cells were meant wasn't necessarily correct. And he insisted that it was and wouldn't listen to anything else. Um, you know, His idea was that cancer cells would ferment because there was a breakdown um, in, in how the cell used oxygen, which, which may be true in some cancers, but was he, he made the statement far too broadly. Um, so Warburg was overstating his case, just to, to give you one example. You, this is the New York Times headline, uh, March 4th, 1956. Um, <laughs> German physiologist is sure that's you know typical Warburg. And you know, at one point in the 50s, he appeared before a group of Nobel laureates and a convention of Nobel laureates and told them that the only thing they needed to know about cancer was what he had discovered, this fermentation and why it happens. And he used the word garbage. Everything else is just garbage. Uh, so that was typical Warburg. He certainly didn't help his, his cause. Um, but, um, you know, even so, you know, the probably more important, you know, thing that, that happened is that just changing trends in cancer science, new discoveries were being made. And, you know, most, you know, there was the viral theory of cancer, which was very popular. And then in the 1970s, um, you have a, you know, critical turning point in, in cancer science, uh, which is the discovery of oncogenes. These are human genes, which uh, were discovered to in, in mutated form to cause cancer, uh, basically setting off signaling networks in, in the cell. So, once you know, cancer scientists had understood the relationship between 
you know, genes and oncogenes and in cancer, it really launched this new era of molecular biology and it was much more sophisticated. It was like unraveling the code of cancer. And meanwhile, Warburg was saying it's about these metabolic enzymes that, um, you know, it's, it seemed old world, it was old world biochemistry. The scientists of the time referred to them as housekeeping enzymes. And um, Warburg, um, you know, all, all the things that he, that he thought were relevant to cancer. And cancer scientists understood that, that they, the cell, of course, if it's growing, still needs nutrients. But it was thought that uh, it was just, you know, whenever the cell needed nutrients, it would take them up. But it had nothing to do with really why a cancer grows. Um, you know, the analogy I sometimes use is they thought of the cancer cell like a computer and, the, you know, all the software and technology well, was interesting. And Warburg was simply interested in, in the plug and, and, you know, what they sort of overlooked is the, the causal direction, which, you know, I'll talk about more with Chi. But anyways, uh, all this stuff that Warburg is interested in just disappears from uh, cancer science. So um, you have, you know, just to give you a sense of, of how far lost Warburg was, you have one of the most famous papers in uh, the history of cancer science, certainly in the modern era, the hallmarks of cancer uh, comes out in 2000 and, you um, sort of tries to boil cancer down to its most fundamental elements. And it doesn't actually even mention Warburg or the metabolic shift uh, that he discovered. So um, there was really no interest in it at all. And you see this in the cancer textbooks. Um, it's just completely lost. And it's amazing how quickly it happened. Uh, and, um, you know, if, the, if things had stopped there, uh, I would certainly not have written this book, but, um, now I'm going to read a little bit more about uh, the rediscovery uh, of what uh, Warburg had learned. Um, so I'm going to turn to this slide. All right. Um, and uh, I guess I can give away that uh, in the far left corner of your screen, you see a, a young Chi Van Bing. Um, okay. So I'm picking up this narrative that I've been trying to explain uh, where cancer, Warburg's, you know, fundamental understanding of what cancer does, uh, and how metabolism affects uh, growth and proliferation it has been lost. Even as memories of Otto Warburg were fading, one scientist, unlike the journey back to Warburg was already beginning. In the summer of 1985, nine years after Bishop and Varmus, these are the scientists who famously identified the first oncogene, published their groundbreaking discovery, Chi Van Dang completed his medical residency at Johns Hopkins and decided to do his clinical fellowship in oncology at UCSF. Dang and his wife, Mary, crammed as much as possible, including their Persian cat, into their red Toyota Tercel and headed west, tracking the route as best they could on AAA maps. The drive from Baltimore to San Francisco was only one more leg in Dang's long journey. Dang, today the scientific director of the International Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research, grew up in Vietnam in a family of 10 children. There was no TV in his home, but there was something to watch. After dinner, his father, the country's first neurosurgeon, would take out the eight millimeter projector and show the children films of surgical techniques. With no better options for entertainment, Dang and his siblings sat and watched. Some of it was pretty gruesome, Deng recalled. In 1967, with the Vietnam War raging, Deng's parents sent him and an older brother to live with an orthopedic surgeon in Flint, Michigan, who had met Deng's father in Vietnam. Deng, 12 at the time, felt guilty about leaving his family behind in a war zone, but he adjusted to his new life well. Though he was sometimes harassed for being Asian, he was relieved that few of his new classmates in Flint realized he was Vietnamese. Deng went on to the University of Michigan, where he studied chemistry. He never planned to become a cancer researcher, but like so many young people interested in medicine and science at the time, he wanted to be a part of the revolution in molecular biology. It felt like a golden moment, Deng recalled, and what better place to experience that moment than UCSF, home to Bishop and Varmus, the two researchers who had put the molecular biology revolution into motion. The adjustment to San Francisco took some time. Dang would drive up the steep hills only to find his Toyota a stick shift rolling back down whenever he tried to switch gears. It was a good reminder that a journey into cancer research can feel Sisyphean at times, yet Dang remained committed, though he officially became stateless when South Vietnam ceased to exist in 1975. He could not have been more firmly rooted in medical science. 
Six of Deng's nine siblings would also become doctors. Another became a dentist. While learning to treat cancer patients, Deng got his chance to interview with Bishop and Varmus themselves for a postdoctoral research position. As he sat down for the meeting, it struck him that he still knew alarmingly little about the new world of molecular biology. When Varmus asked him what he wanted to work on, the most Deng could muster was oncogenes. Varmus nodded and asked him which particular cancer-related gene interested him most. Deng paused. It was a perfectly reasonable question, but one he couldn't answer. Deng told the famous scientist the truth. He had no idea. I barely knew anything, Deng said much later. Varmus pointed Deng toward UCSF researchers, then working on MIC. I'm going to skip a little bit and over a part where I talk about MIC as a transcription factor, a gene that uh, turns on and off other genes. And uh, wherever Deng looked in the cancer cell, he seemed to find traces of mixed influence. All right, I'm going to skip ahead here. After his postdoc at UCSF, Deng returned to Johns Hopkins, still determined to identify the many genes under mixed sway. Lacking today's modern sequencing tools, the search proved maddeningly slow. Work that would take days could stretch on for months, even years, but Dang and the postdocs in his lab pushed ahead, like cartographers tracing the contours of a newly discovered land. They mapped each chain of linked reactions or signaling pathways on diagrams that were reproduced and hung on the walls of cancer labs around the world. The diagrams were breathtakingly complicated. Dang and his generation of cancer biologists were not simply discovering new land, but a land of interconnected mazes, or mostly interconnected. The metabolic enzymes responsible for supplying food and breaking down nutrients for energy did not appear on Deng's diagrams. They had their own separate diagrams, and those became increasingly hard to find in molecular biology labs in the 1980s. Deng was thus surprised when in 1997, after more than a decade of tracing mixed influence on cells, he found that it spread to the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase, LDH. As one of the key players in fermentation, LDH was not supposed to be linked with an oncogene. It was one of the housekeeping enzymes that belonged on the other diagram, the metabolism diagram. Deng had followed Mick to a place that wasn't even on his original map. Deng might have put the finding aside, but he had long felt that it was important to pay attention to discoveries that don't seem to make any sense. Such findings, Deng says, can teach you something. So instead of dismissing metabolic enzymes, Deng began to read as much as he could about them. The reading quickly led him to Otto Warburg, who had isolated LDH and explained its role in fermentation some 60 years later. The literature from Warburg's day confirmed what Dang had found. LDH activity was elevated in cancer. MIC, when overexpressed, wasn't only driving cells to divide more often than they should. It was also driving them to eat and ferment more than they should. The perception was that metabolism was just there to support everything else, Dang said. And yet the more Dang read and reflected, the less sensible it seemed to think of metabolism as somehow separate from the rest of the cancer cells activities. Cancer metabolism, sorry, cancer was like a building project and the different teams on the project had to work together. It has to be a coordinated process so that you can build things in an orderly way, as Dang put it. The bricks and the cement don't somehow magically end up where they're supposed to be. To bring in uh, the man that uh, I just read about, uh, Chi Van Dang, so hi Chi. Welcome, and uh, thank you very much for joining. Thank so, you, Sam. Um, I thought maybe uh, a lot of questions for you that I'd love to ask, but I thought you know one of the things that, that amazed me um, when I first interviewed you is you told me that after you made this discovery about uh, Warburg and or returned to Warburg Science in 1997, that somebody actually took you aside and told you maybe uh, to be careful. <laughs> do, you, do you remember that? Yeah, so absolutely, you know, so um, when we made this discovery, first of all, it's a little bit kind of off the chart because people were very interested in uh, what's broken in the cancer engine. If you want to have the analogy that cancer is a car that's uh, lost control, the, the, the accelerator is stuck, the brakes are broken, and people didn't really pay attention to the fuel line. And, you know, they're more interested in what's broken. And so when we start looking at the fuel, and then I discovered that, you know, this goes all the way back to Otto Warburg. Uh, when I tried to publish that, uh, we had a really hard time trying to get it in quickly, even though we did all the right experiment, because there's a lot of skepticism about, first of all, the fuel line. But really, I was told by a, a very senior uh, scientist who told me that, you know, uh, be careful how you kind of tell the story because Otto Warburg 
uh, you don't, I didn't know that back then, but Otto Warburg was um, a, a, a Jewish man. Um, in fact, you, you probably will tell the audience a little bit more. They probably should read your book to find out, actually. But um, basically, you know, he was an intriguing personality, but the problem was that he stayed in Germany uh, under Hitler and worked essentially, if you will, for Hitler. And so many of the Jewish scientists who've left uh, Europe and came to the U.S. really has a distaste for Warburg. And, uh, and, and that's sort of what I was warned to, to be careful how you tell the story and not bring back, you know, not to exhume, if you will, Warburg back too loudly. Yeah. Yeah. I think there was a, a lot of suspicion, you know, how is it that he survived? Did he collaborate in some ways? And I do think, you know, that, that it's unfair to Warburg because he, he hated the Nazis more than, than anyone. You know, he was a narcissist. He, he hated them, you know, often for the wrong reasons because they were, you know, sort of infringing on him. But, um, you know, he, he certainly, you know, was not sympathetic to the, the Nazis in any way and didn't collaborate. So I think it was unfair, but it's understandable that, um, you know, there was suspicion uh, of him. And, you know, certainly his personality didn't, didn't help that situation. Uh, but I, I wanted to ask you more about, um, you know, as I discuss in my book, you know, in 1997, when your paper comes out, there's still a lot of, you know, concern, hesitancy, and then gradually metabolism catches on. And, and now, you know, there's been this remarkable, you know, Warburg metabolism revival. And uh, just wondering if you can talk a little bit about those first years and, and when things started to really change. Yeah, I think that, you know, after what we reported that, I think that it, it did catch some attention. And then uh, I think in parallel and, and a few years later, you know, Craig Thompson started to make observations that other oncogenes uh, like AKT also drive uh, metabolism uh, sort of independently and cooperatively with MEC. And so here's another cancer driver that regulates specific points in metabolism, also with the, the barber attack, by the way. And then um, after that, I think uh, Lou Cantley, who is also meant, you know, in your book, and that's why people should buy the book and, and read and find out about all these, these other people. But you know, Lou then found another mutation and a very frequently mutated uh, gene called uh, uh, PI3 kinase, which actually Bert Vogelstein at uh, Hopkins actually discovered that, that it's mutated. But the, the connection of that to metabolism actually was made by, by Lou Cantley. And of course, from there on, you, you just see so many people getting involved in this. And now we know many, many drivers of cancer, in fact, are linked to a metabolism one way or the other. And you continue to read these papers, you know, many, you know, it, ju it just really kind of a snowball that rolled and it rolled really fast. And uh, it created also an industry of uh, pharmaceutical companies that's very interested in targeting this, right? Because this is what Warburg had dreamt about and really didn't pursue it really uh, closely. But now, you know, there are companies out there chasing after this, trying to look for vulnerabilities, uh, metabolic vulnerabilities in cancer. So that's how the ball got, got rolling. Okay. And what assessment would you say is, is the state of these pharmaceuticals in terms of you know, sometimes in a simplistic way, it's talked about starving the cancer cell or, you know, robbing a specific nutrient. So have, have these drugs worked thus far? Or, you know, sort of what's the, the state of affairs yeah. now? Yeah, so state of affairs is so, so the, the field got a little bit lucky. Again, going back to Bert Vogelstein at, at Hopkins is that when Bert and his team and the group at, at Duke discovered a mutated enzyme in brain cancer, uh, it's called IDH. And they didn't know, you know, they just saw, saw this mutation very frequently, right, in, in brain cancer. The, of course, the, the, uh, the thing to surmise would be that must do something to the cancer cells. And so at that time, uh, a new company got launched called Agios, um, and, and they start focusing on, on cancer metabolism. And I have to disclose, I was one of the earlier uh, advisory board member. And you know, so, so clearly now you have an enzyme that's mutated and, but specifically in, in, in certain cancers. So what that, what Agios discovered was that this enzyme, when it's mutated, actually becomes a new enzyme that drives tumor, uh, tumor formation. And because it is 
performing as a different enzyme, they're able to target with very specific drugs that only inhibits the mutant enzyme. And I think that's the big win for the field where you clearly get responses in leukemia, for example, not so much so in brain cancer, but leukemia is clearly uh, where the mutation exists. You really get a real clinical benefit from it. And then uh, there are other uh, companies that are still uh, doing uh, clinical trials. Uh, another one that I also have to disclose, I'm an advisor for is, um, is a Raphael that actually has a phase three study in a, a drug uh, called CPI-613 that is, um, has accrued 500 patients in pancreatic cancer. Uh, the phase one study was very promising when you see complete uh, remission in, in metastatic um, pancreatic cancer, which is really unheard of. But that's why you know, it went all the way to phase three where you have 500 patients. And we hope that the initial you know, um, data really holds up and, and ultimately help uh, pancreatic cancer patients. Um, there are other many other companies now are also generating new drugs. And then the shift, of, uh, uh, it's a little bit of gear shift where companies now also interested in drugs that hits metabolism that actually hurts the cancer cell, but at the same time helps the immune system to fight against the cancer cell. So there's another company that actually will, that has phase one studies, a drug that actually coming out of Hopkins Cancer Center actually uh, through the work of Jonathan Powell uh, and that company now has phase one and it shows really promising preclinical uh, uh, information on that targeting glutamine metabolism. So, so there are many different opportunities going on out there right now. And I'm hoping that some of these leads will lead to some real benefits to patients. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's really fascinating what's, what's taking place. And I want to just briefly mention one of the more controversial aspects of the metabolism revolution, which is in diet, which is, you know, always sort of controversial in, in the world of cancer science, in part because, you know, throughout history, there have been so many quack pitching dietary therapies. And um, but in, in the context of prevention, you know, one thing that, that struck me and you know, which I write about somewhat in the book is, is this idea that um, one of these key metabolic pathways that uh, you alluded to with PI3K and AKT, you know, is a, a pathway that's stimulated by the hormone insulin. So there's a lot of research from Canley and others about the role of elevated insulin in cancer, and that really, you know, connects back to diet. So I'm just wondering what, what your take is on that, and if you see any hope for insights about metabolism leading to new prevention strategies. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I think it's probably a little bit less controversial as it becomes more, more and more accepted as more studies are coming out. So clearly, I think that, um, you know, uh, obesity, as, as mentioned in your book, um, you know, does have a real uh, consequence because of elevated in insulin as part of the, the adult um, diabetes. And it's been shown experimentally, and I think it, it has held up pretty well, is that the excess insulin is a growth factor that can stimulate the cancer cells to, to, to grow in an uncontrolled fashion if they have some uh, alterations already in one of the cancer genes. And so I think that it's not as controversial and becoming more and more accepted. Uh, the latest thing I think that's uh, excited to really um, consider is, for example, ketogenic diet that really does lower insulin levels by really avoiding carbohydrates, uh, sugars, and, 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 and uh, carbohydrates. And, and that's also mentioned in your book as well. And, you know, so that I think is holding up also relatively well from ketogenic diet really can have some influence, particularly in all the experimental model at the moment. And uh, just a, another note for Hopkins, because Hopkins actually had um, kind of pioneer the, the ketogenic diet for uh, children uh, with, uh, with seizures and, and uh, the, the ch uh, child um, neurology uh, group actually had done a really great job. In fact, it's really the, the paradigm for, to, to use that in, in children. But now I think that you're gonna start seeing clinical studies with a ketogenic diet. The other thing to keep in mind for prevention too, is that there's a study that's really intriguing and it's also replicated in, in animals, which is a study came in, coming out of uh, UCSD, University of California, San Francisco, where it's not just what you eat, but when you eat. It's, it's really fascinating because what they found is that if you restrict your food intake 
within a, a, a window of six to eight hours, rather than it spreading it out beyond that, that patients with breast cancer, if they restrict their diet, you know, they're eating to that window versus the other patients, their relapse rate of breast cancer was much statistically lower than the people who actually have primary breast cancer, right? And then to back that up, there's another group that actually did a study in, in, in animals where they also did the same th thing called re uh, time restricted feeding. And what they found in, amazingly is insulin level goes down when, when you compare the mice that have ad lib eating versus the one that have restricted feeding. So, so the insulin levels down and they show very, very nicely that it's insulin that actually accelerates the tumor in those animals that eat ad lib, right, without time restriction. So clearly, I think the diet, you know, in fact, our research is moving a little bit into that direction too, because the evidence is really there and it just needs to be explored further and, and you know, hopefully remove some of the cynicism and, and skepticism as more evidence accumulate. Yeah, well said. Um, so we have a, about 10 minutes left. Um, I would love to uh, take a few questions if anybody has any, uh, you can enter them into the chat box. And I, I think uh, Melissa, if you're still there, um, maybe you can let me know if anybody enters a question. If there aren't any right now, I can. Uh... We, we have had a, a few. Um, when um, I'm corrected on the fact that I said you do not have a common theme in your among your books, Sam, Jim Wilson has said, well, the common theme is thoughtful journalism and self-perspective, I agree. I was being a little coy there. Jim also has a question, um, I guess for either, for Sam, maybe for either of you, do you have a hypothesis for what drove Warburg's narcissism? Was it, for example, competition with his father? That's interesting. A really interesting question. I mean, I tend to think that, you know, there's no way to really know. My, my suspicion that it was largely innate that, you know, he, he was just born with that personality, but it was certainly exacerbated by, you know, his being around all these famous people, I think. And, you know, that was his, his standard was, you know, achieving greatness. You know, everybody around him was a, a hero. So how could he not feel like he had to, to be that as well? And, uh, you know, there's one amazing story about Warburg I didn't even get a chance to tell, which was that, um, when he was in uh, the military during World War I, it was actually Albert Einstein that convinced him to come home. Uh, Einstein didn't know, he was very close with Emil Warburg and not so much with Otto Warburg, the son, but he knew that Warburg, I think, was a narcissist because in his letter to Warburg, he tells him over and over, you're just too important for science, you got to come home. And finally, Warburg listened. So, you know, it's possible that, that had Einstein not written that letter and convinced Warburg to leave the military that, you know, the discovery that, you know, my book is about would have never been made. So I'll credit Einstein as well. Yes, interesting. And a, another uh, comment question. Um, someone loves the cover of your book and wants to know, Sam, what was the thought process behind it? I don't yeah. know if you were responsible for the cover design. The thought process was was basically the uh, publisher telling me that uh, all my ideas were wrong, <laughs> uh, and I guess theirs there was right. But I, I um, my initial vision was that that photo that I showed of Warburg with the dog. I just love that image so much because it captures his personality. But I, I think they were right that 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 probably didn't capture him as a scientist, so would not have been the ideal cover. But uh, uh, I think all my instincts were basically wrong, so I'm glad nobody listened to me. <laughs> You're, you're a writer, not a designer. Yes. I, I was, per, I'll jump in with my own little observation question. I was interested, um, Chi, in what you, your, your comment about, um, uh, or your explanation of how you were dissuaded or colleagues took you aside and said, well, you might not want to go there or just be really cautious when you venture into Otto Warburg territory. And that's just so fascinating to me because we think of science as this pure, you know, discipline and bias doesn't come into it and it's just scientific, right? But every now and then you hear stories like that and it, you know, I don't know if you have any thoughts on how common that is, or if it's on the rise, on the decline, or, you know, a rare thing. 
Um, it sounds like you were quite surprised to hear that at the time. Yeah, I'm, I was surprised at that time because I was naive. <laughs> but, ah. you know, as I know the scientific world better and better, I think that, you know, the, it's, it's driven by some strong personalities. I mean, you look at Varberg, right? Uh, one of the things Sam has uncovered, uh, and, and you'll see in his book, Varberg doesn't like other people to disagree with him. So, so some scientists basically is not as open-minded as you think and depends on the culture of, you know, the person that where they, they, they have grew up and, and got trained. But I, I was warned this because it's a more general feeling than just, um, you know, some specific personality that it's something that kind of was buried um, and, uh, you know, it, it, you may be, you know, be more circumspect on how you uh, un recover it back into, into, into the mm -hmm. limelight. So, yeah, so, so great question. That's so interesting. Another question um, from an alum, is it advisable that primary care physicians and endocrinologists should advise patients with type two diabetes to note the increased cancer risk of high carbohydrate diets. Um, I'll let she take the lead. Yeah, yeah. so, so I, 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 would, I would actually um, respond maybe slightly differently because if you are uh, a diabetic, uh, your physician probably will tell you to try to restrict uh, sugar load anyway uh, to begin with just for your own health aside from, from the cancer risk. So I think that an endocrinologist probably would, would go there first. And I don't know how many would actually bring up the, the risks of cancer uh, by hyperinsulinemia um, because the devastating effect of diabetes itself is already pretty prominent. Uh, so probably the focus is there. Um, yes. Uh, this, I'm glad somebody asked this question because I was wondering this too. And this is for you, Sam, but I think maybe Chi, you can step in as well. Did researching this book or doing your own research, scientific research, make you change your own diet? Um, yeah, in, in my case, I, um, I had been uh, sort of interested in metabolism and, and nutrition before um, diving deep into the cancer research, but it, it certainly has made me more fearful of, of sugar in particular. Um, and when I say sugar, I don't mean glucose. I don't mean blood sugar. I mean sucrose, the sweet white stuff, uh, because that molecule seems to be better than almost any other at driving the metabolic problems that, that lead to the elevated insulin. And the elevated insulin seems to have you know, a, a profound role in, in helping cancers grow. So I, I definitely eat less sugar than, than I used to and try to be wary of it. Um, I don't know if the chi has... Any yeah, no, I, I, I've done the same thing, you know, no, um, basically no sugary drinks. It, it just, that just doesn't happen in this house. Um, you know, try to maintain relatively low carbs and, you know, do, do the healthy diet. I mean, I'm more conscious about it. Mm. Okay. So, so Sam, uh, unless there's a question, I have a question for you, Sam. So uh, during your research uh, of your book, um, I know that you went to Germany, you look up a lot of stuff. Were there something that actually popped out that was really surprising to you when you uncovered for your book uh, that kind of like, wow, um, this, this, this is really kind of cool that, you know, was there a moment where you, because I know you dig really deeply uh, about Barbara, more so than I think other people have written about him. Yeah, yeah, there were a bunch. I think, you know, the one that probably shocked me most was, this discovery that he had been in sort of the, the belly of the beast in, in Hitler's chancellery on June 21st, 1941, um, because, you know, that, you know, just seems unbelievable to me that that was the timing of it. And uh, other historians had known that he'd been called in there, but no one had yet realized that date and why it was significant. So that was one. And then another, you know, really surprising thing that happened is I assumed that Warburg you know, insulin, the study of insulin at the time, which is now a big part of the metabolism story, you know, it was really in its very early days. And um, I found uh, Dean Burke, who was a famous chemist and Warburg's friend. I was able to get in touch with his son. And 
his son had uh, in his attic all these old letters from, from Warburg. And it was pretty remarkable to go through them. And, and I discovered that Dean Burke had actually been onto the insulin story really before almost anybody else. And it, it told Warburg, you, you should look at this. This could explain some of this you know, fermentation that you discovered. Warburg, you know, he already had his own idea. He didn't want to hear it. But um, I was very surprised to, to learn that you know, Warburg had a chance to kind of see the modern picture before he died. And it was too soon, but um, he, he would have never been open to it anyway. <laughs> so, mm. uh, that was pretty surprising. And then, um, you know, kind of a, a very cool thing in our last minutes is that I was able to meet Warburg's glass blower in Germany who's still alive. And, you know, he had wow. some great stories about Warburg. And he actually gave me one of the glass vessels that he would use, you know, attached to his manometer. So there's a lot of, you know, really fun and, and exciting moments along the way. Wow. That's fantastic. We have a few more questions. I'll try to go through these um, quickly because there's some good ones here. Uh, a, a question I believe for you, Chi, why um, could you talk a little more about why a ketogenic diet would help alleviate childhood seizures? Kind of tangential to our... Yeah, really briefly, it is thought that the brain actually activity is one of the uh, or our organs that is strictly dependent on glucose. And so when you um, use a ketogenic diet, actually your blood sugar level actually goes down. And that's the, also the reason why insulin goes down because insulin only goes up when you're, you have a spike in, in glucose after you eat, right, to store it away. So I, that's the hypothesis on why it works. It, it definitely works. And it is thought that lowering the glucose level is what's, what's helping. Yeah, it's a fascinating. Because, because you, need, you need the glucose to make the energy for the seizure. It's yes. a fascinating thing. It doesn't work 100% in 100% of the patients, I will say though. Um, and uh, another interesting question, do you think Warburg's arrogance was a defense mechanism in the face of such a dangerous regime? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I think he was certainly arrogant before that, but I think like most famously arrogant people that, you know, he was also deeply insecure, you know, the two things tend to coexist in, in these types. So in a way, I, I do think it was a defense mechanism, you know, not just against the Nazis, but against all the things he was afraid of. Yeah. Okay, this question probably requires an hour, but anyway, uh, Chi, can you speak about the reported role of cancer cells addiction to glutamine and the role that MYC might play in it? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll make a, 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 an hour answer in a, several seconds. So basically, in addition to glucose that you heard about sugar, um, cancer cells also eat fats, they, it eats amino acids like glutamine. So it depends on the type of cancer. Certain cancers that are MYC addicted also becomes addicted to glutamine. So that's where the glutamine drugs can work. Wow, bravo. You must be a science writer. That's wonderful. Uh, uh, let's see, As another question. As treatment for disease moves away from a one size fits all approach and toward things like cell and gene therapies, do you see genetic testing for diet changes that might be effective against disease as part of the move to personalized medicine? Gotta give that one to Chi. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think I, I understand the question. Basically, I think that we're getting cl more clever about um, uh, genetic testing. In this case, it's probably going to be epigenetic testing because we know that uh, metabolism affects your epigenome. That is how your uh, DNA is being read, and how it's read actually is very important in keeping a normal cell dis you know distinctly different than a cancer cell. So I think that you may see this in the future to, to really understand if you have a dietary intervention, can we look at the epigenetic change in your blood to say it's, a, it's, it's appropriate, you know, a little bit kind of a futuristic, but I think we may get. Yes, right. Well, we've come to the end of our questions and the end of our hour. This has been an absolutely fascinating talk. I, um, I just, I feel though that I've had a little appetizer and now I want the full meal. So I cannot wait till my book arrives and I can learn more. And I'm sure a, a lot of folks out here feel the same way. 
So I want to thank you both um, enormously. Um, thank you, Sam, for launching your book with us. And thank you, Chi, both for your contributions to science and for joining us this evening and helping to illuminate us. It's been really terrific. The, the book is ravenous and it will be available. Well, it's available now for order, but it is coming out next week, May 25th. And you can all look forward to that. Thank you folks out there, students, alums, and others for tuning in this evening and asking great questions. Have a great rest of your evening and goodbye all. Thanks everybody, bye. <laughs>